Okay, th- now you're, you're in Norway right now? Excuse me? Th- th- this is Norway. I'm in Norway, yeah. yeah well, what are you doing there? <laughs> you sound really puzzled. Yeah, I've never, uh, what am I doing? I've never called Norway before. Oh, I'm doing a promotional tour around Europe. Is that right? Yeah, so I'm here in Norway doing uh, press and uh, TV show and stuff. Uh-huh. I didn't know you had a following in Norway. Well, apparently I have some, uh, I have some, some followers, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And are, are you traveling throughout Scandinavia? Well, I've, I've just, let's see, I left uh, home in August, and I've been to Spain and Italy and Germany and Holland and Brussels and Germany. And now I'm in, in uh, Norway, and I'm going on to Sweden, and then I'm going home after that. Good Lord, well, lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's. I mean, it's. It's hard. It's. Uh, it's been doing. I'm been doing up to twelve, thirteen interviews a day. Mm-hmm. Um. It, uh, yeah. I guess I am lucky. It's. It's been very intense, but it's fine. Uh huh. But you're pretty interviewed out by this point, I suppose. Well, not really. You know, it depends. Okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I won't worry about it. <laughs> with, that, with that in mind. Um, right. The first question here is about uh, Mitchell Froom. How, how did you? Uh, why did you start working with him? I started working with him because I liked his other productions. Um, I liked his work with Richard Thompson. Mm-hmm. He um, produced Richard's last album. And uh, I, I heard it and I, and I thought it was very interesting. And um, that's sort of the short answer. Is mm-hmm. that uh, I, I thought he had, a, he had very unusual production styles. Well, when we, you know, when we hear the name Mitchell Froom, I guess we sort of think of somebody who uh, uh, keeps things as simple as possible. Um, I don't know if that. What what I liked about him was that, um, first of all, he I liked the people that he worked with, mm-hmm. and each album that he did sounded different. The Crowded House record sounded different from Elvis Costello, mm-hmm. which sounded different from the Chrissy Hind record which sounded different from the Richard Thompson record. And then I could hear on the Richard Thompson record that each, that, that he wasn't afraid to mix styles. Mm-hmm. Richard Thompson is thought of as a folk singer in many parts of the world. And, but but uh, I could hear from Richard Thompson's record that, that Mitchell Froom wasn't afraid to, to mix up certain kinds of sounds and um, that he didn't seem to approach making records with any specific kind of formula. So I sent him a demo tape of some of the songs that I had worked on last fall. And uh, I sent this demo tape to three different producers, and Mitchell came back saying that he really liked the songs, but he didn't like the production, and that it could be a lot more vivid and a lot more... um, um, What was the word that he used? Um, Unusual. And I agreed with him. So I, I uh, asked him how he, he was going to make it more unusual, and he gave me several specific reasons. Uh, several specific, um, not reasons, um, methods to make it more unusual. And one was to take it out of the rock and roll realm. You know, to, to not use the, yeah, not to use the rock and roll drum kit. But since I had a small voice, to, to keep the sounds smaller, but use electronics to use... Um, you, you, to make a, a small acoustic sound and then distort it or blow it up or do other things to it than what I had been doing. Hmm. And so it was very intriguing, so I, I, that's how I ended up using Mitchell. Hmm. I, I guess style-wise, you've kind of been going through a, a, a phase of, of, of volatility because uh, even on the last album, you were sort of undergoing uh, a change in style. Yeah, I, even on Days of Open Hand, I was definitely experimenting and we we had already uh, when Anton and I were working together, we were already experimenting with getting rid of the drum, the big rock and roll drum kit, and tending more towards handheld percussion, at least on some of of the tracks, not all of them, but some of them. So it was kind of a continuation of that of those ideas. Mm-hmm. But in any event, you were you definitely eschewed the uh, the image of Suzanne Vega as folk artist. I mean, completely right. <laughs> No, not completely. Um, I think that would be false if I if I were to to just completely abandon that. 
um, because it's still very much part of what I do. In mm-hmm. fact, a, a lot of the songs are based on acoustic guitar. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things I told Mitchell was I wanted to have the acoustic guitar very firmly at the center mm-hmm. of this album. And it is still very much at the center of the album, even though there's two songs where it doesn't appear at all, where the acoustic guitar doesn't, does not appear at all. But for the rest of the album, mm-hmm. it's still pretty much the center of it. Did the success of Tom the Diner have anything to do with your uh, adopting the electronic sound? Not really. I'd say it was more likely a train of thought I was already on, and I think that even if Tom's Diner had not happened, I probably would have ended up making a record like this at some point anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was very much fun. It was fun to have the Tom's Diner thing happen. Mm -hmm. Um, See, most people will draw a straight line between Luca, Tom's Diner, and then this album. But... That, that's not that, that's the way the public sees it but it's not the way it was not my own private train of thought uh-huh. what do you think's been been uh, uh, putting you on the course you're on what, what, what sort of events have been the, the key events well I, I think it's been a pretty straight line even from the first album because the first album the idea of the first album was to take my acoustic guitar but to but to include other instruments and to stretch the the limits or what I perceived as the limits of of the of the acoustic guitar. So you have a song like Cracking, which I, in my my way of thinking, Cracking was a song that could very easily have fit on this last album. Mm. Partly because of the way I was using the acoustic guitar and mixing the other electronic instruments, and partly because of the subject matter, which is pretty medical. Pretty medical. Medi- medical. <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean? Medical, uh-huh. <laughs> as in health and doctors and stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> Why medical? Well, because, first of all, there are three songs on this record that mention doctors and a couple of others that mention blood and one that mentions the temperature of the human body. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, the medical idea was something I was starting to work with on the last album with songs like 50-50 Chance and Men in a War. I'm developing a new following among doctors, actually. But um, <laughs> uh, it, it's a way of examining feelings and examining the body with, without being sentimental or being corny. It's a way of intimate, being intimate without being mm-hmm. romantic. Mm, I see. I see. Um, a, hor- a horribly speculative, speculative question here, but um, mm-hmm. it talks about how the addition of like acoustic numbers and the album sort of uh, seems to take away from the more techno stuff. Um, in other words, you know, it's like you're going, what, certain songs seem to be going in one direction, and then other songs you kind of uh, uh, stay the same. You know, one step forward, two steps back. Kind of thing. Well, I don't see it that way. I see it as a collection of songs that all fits together in one whole. I don't see it as two steps forward. People seem to think in a straight line, whereas I don't think in a straight line. I tend to think more in, in a circle. Um, people seem to think that if that that the natural way of moving is away from acoustic guitar and towards technological. In other words, once Bob Dylan plays the electric guitar at Newport, there's no going back, and he's never going to play the acoustic guitar again. But that's not the way I see it. I see it um, as the acoustic guitar is my main instrument, and it always will be. Yeah. But in the meantime, I'm happy to go and experiment. Mm-hmm with other kinds of... Oh, the way I see it, I guess, is that the acoustic guitar is like the heart of... It's the heart of the work, but it's not the whole body. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, uh, are you starting to feel like, you know, almost as comfortable in a different format now, though? Yeah, but I think I always did. I mean, I think there were always songs that I... Tom, I wrote Tom's Diner, for example, actually, in 1982, mm-hmm. um, without the acoustic guitar, because I didn't know how to play the music I was hearing in my mind, so... Um, if it comes out eight years later as a disco hit, uh, I'm, I'm kind of surprised, but not, I'm not blown off, you know, I'm not, I'm kind of surprised, but not entirely. (laughs) Um, (coughs) so, yeah, I suppose I'm beginning to feel more comfortable in other formats, but, um, if, uh, I, I just love the acoustic guitar, and I, to me, I don't make any apologies about going back and forth. The way I've always seen it, even from the first album, is that the acoustic guitar is a tool. You, you use it for certain things. It, it doesn't. 
define the whole thing that I like to do. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a question here about uh, Mitchell Froom and his, and his uh, uh, not a coterie, but the you know the people. I guess the people who he involved in the uh, in the recording of the album. Mm-hmm. Um, he was responsible for uh, for David Hidalgo, I guess. Yeah. And uh, Jerry. Marano. Well, he was responsible really for for all the musicians. Oh, is that right? Um, yeah, well, because it, first of all, he 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 has a tendency to like to um, to form, I think, a musical community around him. This is what I've sort of noticed. He doesn't just do one album; he'll do three. So he did um, the Los Lobos. I, I don't know how many records he's done with Los Lobos, but he's definitely worked with them a lot over the last five years. And he's worked with Richard Thompson, and he worked with um, anyway. He's worked with all these musicians before. But he examined each song and decided to make a list of musicians that he thought would be good for that particular song. And we would discuss each song, and he kind of ca- cast each song as though it were a movie of some kind. We would discuss what each song was going to sound like and, and the influences of people that I had been listening to, people like Elvis Costello. Um, and so we decided on, a, on an, an approach beforehand for each song. And he was he would explain to me why he thought it would be good to use Bruce Thomas and Jerry Murata and that it would set up a certain kind of tension to have these two musicians playing with each other because um, they had never played together before. Hmm. Yeah, so it was um, it was well, interesting. Well, it, yeah, it wasn't as though he just grabbed them, brought them in. You know, we discussed everything beforehand. Did, 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 did in the case of each song, did the scenario work out as he had planned it? Yeah, it did. Uh, for example, in Fat Man and Dancing Girl, there's a different bass player than there is for Blood Makes Noise, Mm -hmm. because he decided that Fat Man and Dancing Girl needed a greasier kind of sound. (laughs) So he used, uh, (laughs) this is the way he speaks, he uses that kind of, those kinds of words. So he used Jerry Sheff, who used to play with Elvis Presley, Mm -hmm. um, and and it gives it a slightly, you know, greasier feel, if you want to call it that. (laughs) (laughs) It slides a little bit more. (laughs) But he was was dead on on every call then, huh? Yeah, he was, actually. I mean, this was... And we were also working really fast. Mm-hmm. There was a... Um, we, we were working... I'd say the whole album was finished in about two months, whereas bef- and we had most of the... most of the main ideas sketched out in the first two weeks of working together. Mm-hmm. By the end of the first week, we knew which how this album was going to sound, more or less. Um, it was kind of a, a little explosion there. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, he was he was dead on in in most of the cases. Yeah, the guitars were a little harder. Uh-huh. The guitars, what, the the rhythm section was all right on. The uh, guitars were a little harder, and we had to work more carefully with the guitars. Mm-hmm. W- was there ever a point when you got the feeling that maybe it was kind of getting out of hand, or it wasn't like your album anymore, and maybe he was taking a bit too much control? No, because any time I said anything. Uh, it was imme- they Everyone listened immediately. That seemed to be one of the rules. <laughs> was if I said something, then it it, it goes. <laughs> um, so he's very uh, careful with that. If I said, "Look, I, I think that Blood Sings is going off in a direction I don't like," which it was for for the first week, it, um, Mitchell had some ideas that I didn't like, and I didn't think that they were appropriate. And I said, "Look, I, I don't want to have a rhythm section." On Blood Sings, I don't think it's appropriate for the song. It was gone. I mean, it, it, it wasn't even mentioned again. Mm. And uh, it was the same way pretty much all through the record. Or if I, if I came in and I was listening to In Liverpool, and I said, well, where's that beautiful, chiming electric guitar that we had on it yesterday? Um, and if they had erased it, they'd go back and <laughs> put it back on. Resurrection. <laughs> yeah, so it was, everyone listened very carefully to what I said. Who's this uh, Chad Blake fellow? Chad Blake is the engineer. Um, I mean, he, he has a lot to do with the sounds mm-hmm. uh, on the record. And he and Mitchell have worked together for five years. And they work pretty much as a team. Mm-hmm. And you can also hear Chad Blake Chad Blake's work on the last Tom Waits album, mm-hmm. Bone Machine. Uh-huh. Um, and he's, he's a very, he was sort of a, a very main part of the team. I would imagine this kind of experience is your first, though, to have th- this kind of a uh, you know comprehensive production job done by somebody that, to, to this extent. 
Yeah, it was, because um, the production, usually the producers that I'd worked with before were somewhat inexperienced. Um, and, and I have to say that we had followed a kind of a formula with the last three records, which is that you, you work on the rhythm section. First of all, you use the drum kit, you use the rock and roll drum kit, for the most part, although we experimented a little bit in the last one. And you do things in a certain order. You have the, the, the drums and the bass, and you work on those for a few days, and then you put on the guitars. And um, sometime a few months later, you, you work on the vocals, which tend to take months and months. Whereas in this case, it wasn't like that at all. Yeah, yeah, well, like you, you compare it to a, a movie, and I think that's a very apt comparison. Do you think this is something that could become addictive, uh, an, a, an approach you'd like to take again? I think so. Yeah, I think so. It would really depend on the songs. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt really... The, the thing is that each song had their own character, and Mitchell and Chad seemed to feel comfortable with, with each song, regardless of whether it was Fat Man and Dancing Girl, which was actually Mitchell's song, or whether it was... Um, Blood Makes Noise, or whether it was Song of Sand, it was very easy to switch vocabularies with them, musical vocabularies. Um, so I, I would think that we could work together again in the future. Hmm. Would it be crass to ask if uh, you had any budget limitations on this? Were you given carte blanche uh, by the record company? Well, it wasn't carte blanche, but it was definitely... Um, we had more than we needed. Oh, really? Yeah. Was, it, was that due to the last album, or is it due to Thomas Diner, or what, what exactly is your status right now in the, in the eyes of A&M? <laughs> well, it was due to, um, uh, that's, I mean, that is a bit, uh, that's a bit personal, but it's, um, it's a good, it's a good arrangement, um, because after Solitude Standing, we renegotiated with them, and, and we did very well, um, what, what is my standing? I think they've been great. With this album, they've been absolutely wonderful. They've mm -hmm. been really supportive and really excited, and um, yeah, things got a little, uh, things were a little strained uh, with the last album, but uh, mm -hmm. but they were also going through their own, they had just been bought out by Polygram, so they were going through their own organizational spasms, you know, they were kind of uh, having a bit of a hard time there, so. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I think that uh, everything kind of came around hmm. in a good way. Uh -huh. now, is this but it was not a very expen it was not an expensive album to make it, and it was not it's not as technological as it sounds. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is organic sounds that were distorted by Chad. Mm -hmm. Most people assume that it's Mitchell kind of feverishly playing all the all the keyboards and, and dreaming up all kinds of um, techno techno things. But it, it's really <laughs> it's really kind of an organic album that happens to be distorted um, and, and, and twisted in, in, in certain ways. And I, I suppose also that uh, studio time is uh, proportionate to cost there, so the, by dint of the fact that you finished it so quickly, uh, you saved a lot of money. It's true, although we weren't working in very expensive places either. Hmm. That seemed to be the mentality of this album was to to work in cheap places, or, or if, if, the, if we had the opportunity to work in a big, expensive place, we chose the cheaper, more, um, the cheaper, more idiosyncratic, more weird little places, as opposed mm. to big, big, expensive ones. Mm -hmm. That was sort of the aesthetic. Uh -huh. Let me just flip my tape, tape for just a second. I just didn't want to cut you off in the middle of a question. Okay, mm -hmm. let me see here. <clears throat> question number eight. Um, uh, the, uh, the producer of the last album, Anton, uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Co-producer, yeah. A co-producer, okay. Okay, well, uh, okay this, this may overlap a, a little bit with, with what we were talking about, but uh, did you go to a lot of trouble to, to find a replacement for him? You said you sent out a demo to three different producers. Who, who mm -hmm. are the others? The others were Paul Fox and Scott Litt. And Paul Fox is sort of known for his work with um, XTC and the Sugar Cubes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got a very long list of people that he works with. And then Scott Litt is known mostly for his work with R.E.M. Mm -hmm. And you just chose them because uh, you, you like those the particular albums by those artists. Yeah, and I like the kind of sensibility that they... Um, I like this sort of alternative sensibility. 
Are, are you a radio listener? Do you follow uh, what's going on? Not closely, but I, I listen to some degree. I mean, mostly I listen to classical music. But um, when I like any music, it tends to be the more alternative stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, like, when you say classical, what sort of stuff do you listen to? Oh, I just listen to the classical radio station all day long. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I like Rachmaninoff, and I like Chopin, and I like, uh, you know, those guys. Mm-hmm. It says, okay, question nine. It says, your last time you came to Japan, uh, the, the guy who wrote the question is here, Mr. Suzuki, uh, saw you on TV, and it seemed you, you seemed at the time you were sort of a a giddy woman in love. He says, um, "Really? Well, I wasn't feeling like one." <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, maybe you were just—he saw you on an optimistic day. Maybe just giddy. I think I was a little tired. <laughs> I think I was on a world tour that was that was uh, extremely exhausting. I was probably just giddy. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. A giddy woman in love. Okay. <laughs> And he says that this this album, uh, uh, 99.9, uh, seems to be a bit more uh, raw. Um, it, it handles a emotion, bit more raw. Uh, it handles emotions that are more raw. There, there are themes that are that, ha- that deal with emotions that are uh, a bit more uh, uh, open. And he, he wants to know mm. does uh, I, I don't know if this is fact now. He says does, does your Having ended your relationship with Anton, did it have any effect on your songwriting? <laughs> I see. <laughs> We're getting to the point here. Um, hey, what can I say? <laughs> Nine, this is a test. That's okay. I've uh, it's not it's certainly not any worse than some of the ones I've been fending off. Um, did it have any effect on my songwriting? Not really. I don't really write songs about speci- specific relationships. Um, I certainly wasn't going to write any, you know, Dear Anton songs. Uh, Anton and I are still friends and, and still speak to one another. And um, I think I always write about raw emotions. And uh, I, I don't, while I may have been giddy, I don't think it was specifically uh, the emotions of a, of a giddy young woman in love. Um so, said when you were on TV, you appeared that way. Are you yeah, well, I was probably just get, I mean, I just get in that mood sometimes, mm-hmm. and, the, and I start giggling, and, and uh, mm-hmm. it usually has more to do with uh, whether I'm tired or not. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> okay. But, but what, what, does it, it, did it have an effect in my songwriting? It made me... Um, not, not specifically. I mean, um, yeah, not specifically. I mean, I had been writing with Anton for many years, so suddenly to start writing songs by myself again was probably gave me a new feeling of energy. But it wasn't specifically. I don't. I don't have any songs on the album that are about breaking up with Anton. Uh-huh. If that's what he wants to know. I suppose any you know event in your life can have an effect on your songwriting, not necessarily. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, meeting my father had an effect to some degree on my songwriting, but it doesn't mean that I write songs about my father. Yeah, yeah, um, I'm getting honked at by a truck and have a <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> It's a rather tough question to deal with. Um, okay. and here's another broad one. Um, sure. Uh, what, in what way does this album differ uh, from other albums? I mean, what is the most glaring difference, you think? It's the difference in the approach. It's the difference in the spirit which means a difference in what you hear. Um, if you have a difference in the approach, it means you're going to... The sounds are going to be different. Um, because I, I think there's more of a difference. Some people will say, well, obviously, she has different kinds of sounds on this record, but I think it goes beyond that. Um, it's not just that we did the same thing, only we added a lot of banging, clanging noises. This is... Uh, we we approached it just differently from the from from the ground up. Instead of going for a record that was clean and smooth, um, we kept a lot of the parts that were not clean and not smooth. If something sounded weird or funny or peculiar or eccentric, we were more likely to keep it. Although the other side of it was that anything that was deliberately perverse was not accepted. Um, so it was like a different uh, game plan, different hmm. different rules. Yeah. Well, I, I guess you just wanted to, to, to show things as they were. I mean, un- unpolished, uh, but sort of just there. 
Yeah, but but at the same time, it, it's not. Um, I was expecting myself more of an acoustic, straightforward kind of rock and roll, not rock and roll album, but like acoustic record uh, based on the acoustic guitar with some, maybe some, some more like what he does with Peter Case. What Mitchell does with Peter Case is that he keeps the acoustic guitar pretty much, but then there, there's some rock and roll influences. But this one seemed to explode. I mean, this one had more of almost a psychedelic feel to it. More stylized than mm -hmm. expected. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the title, 99.9 uh, .9, uh, degrees, um, is, this, is this meant to, is, the, the fact that it's just a little above uh, normal temperature, does this, does this refer to like a change that's small but very significant? Um, I think that, I think not so much a change that's small but significant. It's more like, um, having enough of a fever to make you see things in a strange way or hear them in a strange way. Uh, something that's not, not the norm. No, I don't think that the other albums were, had, had sort of quote unquote normal points of view either. Um, I think that's what I'm always trying to do is look at daily life, look at, at ordinary life and uncover the extraordinary in it. Um, so this is kind of the attitude is that it, it, it was slight fever, you're a little sick. You're not enough to make you delirious and out of your mind, but enough to make you see ordinary life in an unusual way. Hmm. Hmm. So in other words, a small but significant difference. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, it depends on how you mean that, because it, does he mean a small but significant difference in in f from the last albums? Well, because no, he, it, I, 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 all, all it says you just mean is, in life, in general. Well, all it says, he says in, in quotations, and, and uh, he, ha he has it marked in quotations, and I, and I will translate this directly. It says it, it's, it's ju ju just enough to not even be uh, visible, uh, and yet it's an internal change that's very significant. I think that would be accurate. It, it, what it is, is is the line that says it could be normal, but it isn't quite. So, however you want to translate that is, uh, okay. is <laughs> a small but significant change. I think so. Yeah, maybe he's, maybe he's right. Maybe it's an internal, mm -hmm. s small change. Okay. Question eleven. Yes. <laughs> okay. On the twelve. Um, there's a, I, guess, I haven't seen this, but there's I guess a photo on the inner sleeve of you in like uh, fishnet stockings. Fishnet stockings. Yes. It, yeah, it's true. And he said uh, that you don't have to be. Uh, a devoted uh, Suzanne Vega fan to be uh, taken aback by this in a good in a in a good way. Uh, oh, that's good. <laughs> he said it seems like you've never really uh, been interested in uh, showing my legs before. Well, showing <laughs> the, the, the sexy side. Uh, what exactly was the intention here? The intention was to um, show myself in character. The character that I'm, I'm dressed up as, the dancing girl from the song Fat Man and Dancing Girl. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to show a more playful side and the side of me that, that likes to be in character. Mm. And this one happens to be a, a relatively sexy character. She's not a very pleasant one, but she's kind of sexy in her, in her way. Mm -hmm. um, why this particular character? It's just one song, right, from the album? Right. Well, because the, 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 if you see the whole the whole picture, I'm sitting among many different characters. Mm -hmm. there's the, I'm sitting next to the megaphone man, and I'm sitting. There's a fat man in the back, and then there's a. Um, I want. I wanted to use it to illustrate that song, which in turn to me illustrates the whole album, because the whole album is filled with strange characters, mm -hmm. and the feel of it is kind of like a very disturbing vaudeville show. It's like a, f a disturbing vaudeville show, it, it, like a f like a traveling circus if it was photographed by a Diane Arbus, mm -hmm. which to me has the feel of the whole album. Mm -hmm. The whole album has has these strange characters on it and unusual, um, yeah, strange characters. So I, I wanted to, to to me it 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 uh, described the feeling of the album. And uh, the other thing is that I was a d I've been a dancer for ten years, and and uh, I don't know. I guess I just uh, felt it was time to uh, put on my dancing girl outfit. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said you were going to say you've been a dancer for ten years, so it's time to show off those legs. 
Well, it, you know, I don't know. I guess I felt if I was ever going to show my legs, now would be a good time. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm 33 years old. I figured it's a, I'm at a good age in my life, and uh, if I was going to show my legs, I suppose I should do them now. But, you know, I, to me it wasn't a huge... I wasn't going to make a poster out of it and try and sell the album with my new sexy image. Um, this was, I just felt that it was time to, uh, to, to play. Uh-huh. It's time to play. This is the first time you've done this, though, I think, right? Where you've assumed the, the persona of, of a character in a song? It's the first time I've done it in the artwork. But, if, uh, but I do it all the time in the songs. My name is Luca. Yeah, right, right. Um, uh-huh. You know, Casper Hauser's song. Uh, this is something I'm always doing mm-hmm. in the music, and I guess I felt it was time to come out. Mm-hmm. Well, this, uh, well, I think one reason to surprise this guy, and then this will overlap with the next question, but he always assumed you were more of a, of a, of a detached type of a performer, uh, one not so assertive. And he, he raises the name Sophie B. Hawkins here because he's, he said she would like to mm-hmm. uh, represent the uh, direct opposite of you. I would say that Sophie B. Hawkins is probably the direct opposite, or one of the opposites. Um, well, from what I see in her video, she tends to use sex as the main thing she sings about and the main thing that she presents. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's that case. It's the case with me. Right. Um, I think as long as I'm performing, I would not come forth as myself in that. In that, this is not how I would present myself to the world mm-hmm. on a normal day. But I feel comfortable in the character of the dancing girl as it's to coming out with my fishnet stockings because it's a character. Mm-hmm. And that's what's interesting to me. In other words, I don't define myself by that. Mm-hmm. I'm not presenting sex as, the, as my defining element. Right, it's, right. In this case, it's just one mm-hmm. small element. And, uh, um, and as to whether I'm assertive or not assertive, I mean, I think these qualities have been kind of lurking in the music for a long time. It's just that I never quite had the atmosphere to bring these things out in. Mm-hmm. That's the thing most people don't realize. Most people in the public assume that if you're presenting something different to them, you must have changed in some radical way, whereas the way I perceive it, you know, it's, a, it's the thing between the, the linear way of seeing life and the circular one. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like I've had those things within myself since I'm seven years old. It's just a question of how do you create the right atmosphere to bring those things out in. Hmm. Why was the time now, though? I mean, what, what, why are we at the station? Because we worked now? in a different way. Because, um, why now? I'm not sure. I think it's because I found a group of people that I was comfortable with mm-hmm. to bring out those other more peculiar sides. Because in the past, the, the game plan was always make it as clean as possible, as pretty as possible. Um, and suddenly it's like, well, let's not be quite as clean and quite as pretty. And uh, see what else is in there. Mm-hmm. And I guess I felt comfortable with this particular group of people. Well, n- now that you're in this sort of phase, do you think this will affect your stage show at all? Live performance? Yeah, I do. I think... Um, I think there will be a time, there, there's a part of the show that I will play with my acoustic guitar, and then there might be a part of the show where I put the acoustic guitar down, which I had done on the last show, which is, it's not, but I might come out in character. Maybe I'll bring the dancing girl out on stage, mm-hmm. and, and she can sing a few of the songs. Mm-hmm. You, you've never, like, like danced as, as part of your show, right? No. I'm not saying I'm going to this time either. I'm just saying that maybe I'll bring the dancing girl out as part of the show. I don't know. I have not worked on it yet. I don't know what I'm going to have her doing. <laughs> I assume she'd be dancing to some degree, but she's not going to be doing hip-hop music. <laughs> what kind of dance do you specialize in? Well, um, this has nothing to do with the show. Yeah, but no, but I mean, just out of what, I, what I majored in as a dancer was, was the Martha Graham technique, mm-hmm. was, was modern dance. But I studied all kinds of dancing, from from ballet dancing to tap dancing to jazz to, I mean, I, but the thing, the kind of mu- movement that I love is more like Iggy Pop or more like Peter Gabriel. Mm-hmm. I'm not likely to work with a choreographer. I'm likely to come up with movements that I think are more natural. Mm-hmm. Is it something you still pursue during your off hours? Yeah, I really love. I love dancing. I don't do it very often in public, but I'll do it in my apartment, or if if I'm with a group of people and everyone's dancing, I'll definitely get up and dance. Is that right? Why, why have you never pursued it publicly? 
because I've never been able to make the music sound like something I wanted to dance to. Mm-hmm. It's very, it would be very hard to dance to something like Small Blue Thing. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've ever tried dancing to my records, you'll know what I mean. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not a natural, <laughs> it's not your first impulse. Yeah, I think we'll stick to the Sugar Hill Gang for the time being. Uh, <laughs> stick to what? I, I, I think I, I think we I've got what I need here. There was there was a, a, okay. a there was an odd question seventeen here. He, was, he said that now, now that you're broken up with with Anton, is there a one in? He's obsessed. He's a man obsessed. Go ahead. Yeah, is, is there a one in one hundred million chance that he could ask you out for a date? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one in one million. No. <laughs> uh, 